You're listening to We Deepen Media. Have you heard? The We Deepen Podcast Network has a new show. The Elevate to Legendary podcast by Dr. Nikki is a journey to activate your fullest self-expression. Dr. Nikki interviews leaders who have transcended perceived limitations in order to make a meaningful impact. Guests share their stories to teach you how to optimize your body, brain, and spiritual connection to manifest a truly fantastic life. Be sure to search for Elevate to Legendary with Dr. Nikki in your podcast app or go to wedeepen.com backslash podcasts to subscribe now and listen later. Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Deepen with Christina. I'm your host, Christina Weber, and I am just going to get right into it today. Of course, I want you to go to wedeepen.com and check out the calendar, but today I am at Unleash. It's a three-day transformational guided dance journey in Miami. It always switches locations, but today we're here in Miami, and I am sitting with one of the keynote speakers of Relate Fest. Last weekend was, you know, 2.5 days of play and connection and learning around relationships for people who are endlessly curious about relationships. And I met this woman, Francesca, and I actually first experienced her on the stage at Relate Fest. And her session was just so uh, entertaining, so charismatic, and it was on the topic of healing through BDSM. I've also invited my associate producer of Deepen with Christina, Jorge, is going to jump in on this conversation. He's going to be here with us. Uh, So the three of us are sitting in a tent. Uh, You're going to hear if any sounds happen. We are just we're in real life right now that you're you're catching us. And uh, we're going to dive into BDSM, intimacy, and Francesca has been, I imagine, I mean, I'm going to make up decades and upon decades of doing this work because you are an elder. You're 60. I love what you said before. 60 more. 60 more. 60 more. (laughs) And and also, you know, my little um, insecurity around pronunciation. I'm going to say Francesca Gentile. 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 Jorge Torres. Oh, I was going to have you say Francesca's name, but I like how you said your full name. Oh, I want to say his name too. Jorge Torres. Mm. And how fun is it to say Christina Weber too? Okay. okay. <laughs> Christina Weber. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's let's jump right in. I mean, BDSM is a topic that I know about from the you know, the, the, the window, I'll say I've been looking in through the window. And for me, probably about 10 years ago, I was living in New York City, and I began a relationship with one of my best guy friends. And early in the relationship, he shared with me um, that he was into BDSM. And it was actually, this is this is kind of a, a funny, there was, uh, he kept saying, you know, I have something that I want to share you. There's one more, and he kept saying, I have something I want to share you. I have something that I want to share you about. And uh, as we were getting ready for the day and to get out of the house and m- making breakfast and I was ready to go because I had somewhere to be. And he's like, wait, you told me that like I could show you something. I was like, OK, what is it? So he sat me down in front of a computer and he started playing a video. And in the video, I saw there was a woman with a gag ball in her mouth and um, a man kind of spanking her from behind. And that was his way of showing me that he was into BDSM. Now, we only, our relationship ended for other reasons shortly after that. So I had a little peak of an experience with it. Um, And it was also happened to be around the time of Fifty Shades of Grey was in its biggest popularity. And I would be on the subway in New York City and there would be like five women on the subway all reading the Fifty Shades of Grey book. So that's kind of the extent that I know of it. And I'd love to start the conversation with you sharing how you got into 
practicing BDSM and then also being a teacher of BDSM. Mm, really, really great. And I love that you started with you know, the ball gag and the spanking and Fifty Shades of Grey because there is a an already always listening in the culture for what people think BDSM might be. And I'm going to ask everyone whether you identify in BDSM or whether you're like, what the frick is BDSM? For the purpose of this podcast to give up knowing what you think it is. And let's enter into a bit of the unknown for a moment. And what I mean by that is that first I'm going to go to something very known, which is our normative regular culture where sexuality is shamed by religion, where pornography shows us an unrealistic expectation of always being hard and wet and ready, where romantic novels or movies also show us an unrealistic expectation of perfect and complete attunement to one another without ever having to talk about anything. And in religion, the only way that sex becomes healthy or sacred is in the sanctity of marriage. And then maybe it's with one other person in a missionary position for the sake of procreation. Now, that menu of sexuality then is very limited or confusing. Shame-based, limited, or confusing. There is inherent or automatic levels of trauma that starts to come in as we shame our desires, as we shame our fantasies, as we shame our uh, wish for exploration, or even learning in sexuality. Because, of course, one of the projected traumas to men is that they're already always supposed to know everything about sexuality and that they can never ask and that they're supposed to completely attune to a woman's body and she should never have to say anything. This is a recipe for disaster, as many of us know. And then I want, so that that's the old limited paradigm. Now I'm going to invite us into a new and perhaps ancient paradigm, which is the world, the expansive, unlimited menu in BDSM. So imagine it's an unlimited, expansive menu. It's only limited by your imagination and consent. And within this playground of BDSM, B is, can be bondage, B can also be um, beatings, D can be dominance, it can also be discipline, uh, S can be uh, sadomasochism, but it can also be service, M can be, uh, you know, mistress, master, it can also be masochism. But the world, the world of BDSM, the actual menu is even bigger. It is a menu of exploring all the senses, all the sensations, from savory to sweet to spicy to sharp. It's a menu of all the roles. So rather than just husband and wife being the only role, it could be pet and pen odor. It could be uh, French maid and, you, you know, lord or lady of the manor. It could be fairies at play. It could be anything. And then it could also be who's in charge, an exploration or a dance of who's in charge. So we have all the sensations, all the roles, and all the dances of who's in charge. And that the roots, the actual roots of BDSM are in shamanism. They go back, you know, 20, 30,000 years. And they were originally used for wholeness, vision quest, rebalancing the body, recovery, discovery, uncovery of parts of ourselves that might be missing, uh, offering to the divine. So when we're starting to explore this world today, I'm inviting us to think of it a new way. And how I got into it was actually through two, two pathways, one, the scientific psychological, but the other, the spiritual shamanic. Mm. So on the one hand, I am a clinical sexologist and, you know, give me the science of it and replicatable data, you know, how does arousal work in the body? But then I'm also this deeply spiritual person that really wants to tune into a, a life that has meaning connected to source or to the beyond or really does attune to one another and feel deeply with one another. And I had already been 
a priestess shaman for about 25 years, as well as a clinical sexologist for over 15, when I met a man, isn't it often a partner that brings us into something new? I met a man who very similarly said that he could be tantric, which means eye gazing and breathing and going very slowly, but that he'd grown up in San Francisco and that he'd been sneaking into BDSM clubs since he was 17. And he very much identified with being a kinky dominant. And I had been teaching healing with sacred arrows. I'd been teaching sex magic. But I'd started to hear a voice that said, the next thing that you're meant to teach is Dark Eros, the Temple of Power and Surrender. And I thought, what? Because I didn't, I did, okay, this is very important to understand. I did not identify as kinky. In fact, I thought that BDSM and kinky things were disgusting. People like, ugh, you know, wearing chains and leather and beating each other. That's got to come from trauma. Ugh. So when, you know, I basically hear the voice of the, of the soul saying, you're meant to teach this. My response is, what? You know, you've got to be kidding. And this voice is saying, no, you're actually meant to bring back the sacred and the healing roots of BDSM, which are in shamanism. And I said, okay. And a couple of years went by. And then when I met this man and he said that he was a kinky dominant, I heard this voice saying, he is your doorway. And I said, um, I think I'm meant to learn this with you. And that was the beginning. And one of our first weeks together, we shared a spiritual path. We were at a temple uh, over the weekend. I get downloads in the morning. Maybe some of you in that relaxed state between sleeping and waking, the bathtub, you know, the walk. Your mind goes into that, that relaxed state where you are open to the connection, like the, what they call the quantum connection, the consciousness connection. There's a book called Blink, which talks about these moments of profound intuition. And we need to be in that ventral vagal system. We need to be in the relaxed system to be able to connect in a larger way with others or with our universe. So that relaxation helps. And in the morning, that relaxation is where I often get my downloads. So I got a download. I, I knelt outside the bed. I was naked. I woke him up. I said, I have a gift for you. He said, can it wait? Because because it was early, I said no. I have to give it to you now. So we sat up in bed, and I said, "I offer myself to you, in unconditional love, service, and devotion, heart, body, mind, spirit, and eros." And he rubbed his eyes, and he looked very shocked. And then he said, um, "Does this mean you want my collar?" Well, at the time, I didn't know what a collar was. You know, maybe like dogs wear collars, but I didn't really know what a collar was. So I decided to meditate. And in meditation, I heard say yes. So I said yes. And what I just did, by the way, I don't recommend is I began my journey with BDSM as a collared submissive. So I started, one could say, in the deep end. And in a very short period of time, I was going to about three events a week and being an extra on kink.com, which is a a kinky porn site. So it was a very deep, quick entrance into the world of BDSM. Wow. Uh, fascinating. And so many questions. I'm going to work backwards in my thoughts. So you, you, you said you wouldn't recommend that someone start the way that you did. And I also heard that he offered you a collar and you said, I'm, I'm, you went and meditate it for a moment. So there was a moment of thinking, okay, so she's going slowly into, there's a pause before the jumping and saying yes to feeling into your own energetics. And is this okay for you? But then you said you jumped right in and you wouldn't recommend it this way to anybody else. Why is that? Well, you know, BDSM can fuck you up or it can be really healing. It is high risk because of the sensations that we're utilizing. When we tie people up, we could actually damage their nerves. When we do breath play, uh, a friend of mine is an expert BDSM witness in court, and the most, uh, the most lawsuits that have gone to court have been around people dying through breath play. So there, there is high risk in some of the 
tools and techniques that we utilize in BDSM. Then the psychological impact. So I, I invite us to think about the brain. It has these three parts, the front of the forehead and right behind it is our frontal lobes, our neocortex, where we actually, where we make discerning, contemplated decisions. Further back in kind of the mid-range of the brain and around to our ears is our limbic system where we feel with each other and we have mirror neurons. At the base of the brain, the base of the neck is the base of the head at the top of the neck is goes into our brain stem, which is evolutionarily our oldest part. And this is where we're the most reactive, our fight, flight, freeze, fuck. And when we've had trauma, and most of us have had some sort of trauma, we're about 5,000 years in to enculturated trauma, this gets wired into the limbic system in the brain stem. The limbic system is feeling an image. The brain stem is sensation and movement. So BDSM works in feeling an image, sensation, and movement. So it can be very, very healing, but it could also deeply re-traumatize. So that's why I recommend uh, having education, which is one of the gold standards in the community of BDSM, is to take classes, to be educated, to go to meetups, which are sometimes called munches. To, to get information so that you can vet the people that you're playing with appropriately because these people can make such a positive difference in your life or could end up, you know, consciously or semi-consciously being perpetrators. So for me, that four-year relationship was the best of times and the worst of times, and I learned from both. And, you know, I was lucky that nothing more damaging happened. And I, he did slap me non-consensually, he did have parts of himself that were disassociated that would come out that he couldn't remember later. And, you know, I've come to find out that m many of us go into periods of disassociation where we don't remember the argument that we had. We don't remember what we said. And it's a part of how our brain tries to cope with traumas is to just is to shut them off in a certain way. So when we're putting ourselves with so much risk with another person, it's really wise to do some vetting and to, I think, have a mentor in the community that you're not planning to play with or have sex with. So you can have that touchstone, like your associate producer, you know, that you can have that touchstone to say, well, what do you think? And how does this sound to you? And is this healthy in BDSM? Or what do you know? Uh, because it's so powerful. Mm, yeah, safety is, is so important. And especially it's fascinating that you have a friend who goes to court to help people who are navigating these types of um, traumatic situations. There's actually a, I didn't know I was going to go there, but a podcast uh, that I recorded recently about a friend who passed away. And there is, we're, we're pretty sure that something of that sort of situation was a reason of her passing. Uh you talk about, you know, early on you mentioned about uh, that BDSM is an ancient, uh, I don't know if I want to call it a technique, an ancient practice. And I remember in that relationship that I had with my best friend who I'd started dating, and he had, when I asked him, how did you get into this? He said that when he was in kindergarten, he had visions of tying his teacher up. So a five-year-old boy envisions of tying his teacher up. And I have to think about where did that come from? Is that part of the ancestral roots that's running through us? Oh, such a complex and rich question. And I just wanted to go back for a moment to the friend that I was saying. And a shout out to Jay Wiseman. Jay Wiseman, who is a preeminent author in BDSM. And some of his books are the best beginner books in BDSM. Jay Wiseman. But when we look at identity versus evolution or becoming, so the brain is neuroplastic, we're capable of much more than we think we are, you know, who we think we are is often a habit. And yet there is a temperament template, an epigenetic template that we come in with. So when we ask someone, how, to, how and when did you know you were gay? How and when did you know you were kinky? How and when did, did you know you were polyamorous? When we ask people these types of questions, they will often go back to a memory either somewhere between, you know, four to seven, which is our first testosterone spike 
developmentally, or they'll go to a memory somewhere between like 10 and 13 with a, where a second testosterone spike is. Both of those testosterone spikes get us ready for becoming fertile and mating and, uh, you know, having babies in the world. So when people say this is my, this is my orientation, this is my identity, they're referring back to that early memories. However, I just hope for the hope for people where they have a differentiation. One of them kink identifies as kinky, one doesn't. One of them identifies as some erotic template that the other one doesn't have. I am a living example of is it, it is possible to develop interests in things that you didn't. So now I do identify as kinky where I wouldn't have before. And when we look at where do these, where do these, where does being gay come from? Where does being poly come from? Where does being kinky come from? I think that there is a soul energy that we come in with. You know, sometimes things are affected by trauma, but not always that we really have a soul and that I am, Many people that identify as kinky very young will say that they would tie their cousins up or they wanted to be tied up or, like you said, tie the teacher up or that there's some there's some memory that they can go back to that that really lands it for them. Oh, I've always been kinky. Now, I consider that a bit distinct from uh, those of you out there who might be shamanic kinky or shamanic BDSM. And you can be both. You can be erotically kinky and shamanically kinky and you're shamanically anything if you have more of a connection to energy earth air fire water and spirit you have a deep calling to bring wholeness to our earth in some way to me that is a shamanic temperament that's a shamanic spirit and in your shamanic memories, like when people would ask me, you know, what's your fantasy? And, and people would, you know, have all these f fantasies of uh, being, uh, you know, tied or being, you know, sex in public or sex with three people. And I would think, what is my fantasy? My fantasy would often be uh, making love on an altar, not a Catholic altar, you know, like an ancient altar in the woods or something like that. And so I would... I would, or I would say that my uh, orientation or identity is actually shamanic. So they can, they can be put together, and yet they're a little bit distinct. So the shamanic roots, and this is important, is the role of a shaman is to restore harmony. So those of us who have shamanic temperaments are often the sensitives. We really notice the energy in the room, the energy of a community, we're very sensitive to the lie that's being spoken. Even when we're little, it would maybe drive us crazy that people would speak on one level like I'm fine and we could tell they weren't fine. Or I, I, love, I love your mother, father. And it's like, no, you don't. And we could tell this, this lie that was being spoken. Mm. And so the, the shamanic temperament is very attuned to what is out of balance some of us may walk into buildings and feel like we have to walk out. You know, the energy here is wrong or there was a death here. Some of us see ancestors. Some of us commune very deeply with plants or with animals or insects. That we can often go back to childhood and feel like there's some profound uh, memories. We're often deep dreamers, literally remembering dreams back to childhood. So the shaman would have been noticed in culture like, you know, the Dalai Lama is chosen before he's three. So when we're younger than, than four, we're considered to be still close to source. I had a conversation with my son when he was about two and a half. He talked with me about the soul for two hours and then later said, don't tell anybody. So there's, there's this deep connection when we're very, very young. And if that was encouraged, some of us become that shaman that notices that the plants are out of balance and really wants to bring harmony to this grounded earth. Some of us feel it so deeply with the animals. I know a number of animal shamans that, that when the animals are in pain, really want to restore that harmony. Other people, many, I would say, intimacy counselors, sex coaches, therapists, feel the dissonance or the disharmony in the couple 
or in the individual, some more in the family. And they're very much called to restore this sense of harmony. So if you're listening and you think, oh, my God, I really do notice these areas of disharmony, you might be that shaman on the inside. And then possible tools, you know, we're talking a lot these days about ethnogens, the plant medicines, but other tools can be sensation. Flogging is like a a good massage. It goes back, flogging with birch branches, eucalyptus, to cleanse the body, to awaken the body, to balance the energy in the body goes back thousands and thousands of years. It's still being used in Scandinavian countries and some of the Middle Eastern countries. It has never been lost. When we think of acupuncture, where we're putting needles all over the body, how kinky is that? (laughs) And in BDSM, it's called needle play. And so there's also when we are in constraint that our mind goes free. One of my girlfriends said, finally, when I'm tied up, I feel like there's nowhere to go and nothing to do. And I can finally surrender to pleasure. Well, you could also surrender to spirit or go on a vision quest. One of my girlfriends wanted to get clear whether or not she would have a baby before or after her PhD. And I did a a ritual for her where I was with her uh, collaboration in designing it, where she was being flogged and chanted to and sung to, and then there were Tibetan bells, etc. And we sent her, it was more than one of us, sent her on a journey in her mind to find her higher self and ask what she should do. And she had a beautiful baby, and she afterwards finished her PhD. So she got clarity in that vision quest. So when I say these toys, tools, and techniques are very ancient, that's what I mean. And The oldest writing in our world today is the cuneiform tablets of Inanna, the goddess of heaven and earth in Sumeria. And part of her story is the story of going down through the seven gates and being flogged and then being killed and hung up on a meat hook to dry and then ultimately saved by the spirit of compassion and mercy. And it's a very kinky story, and it's the root of the Dance of the Seven Veils, is this sense of being stripped of who we think we are, stripped of our emotions, our thoughts, our power, so that we're down to nothing, so that we can be reborn again. And that is another way to use the toys, tools, and techniques of BDSM. For someone that hasn't heard of the word flogged, can you explain what that is? (laughs) Also... The definition for BDSM for those that may not know what that means. Mm-hmm. You know, for, for those of us who are Catholic, it's like everybody must know flogging because <laughs> self-flagellation is a thing in Catholicism. How kinky is that? Uh, so uh, a flogger is uh, it's usually made of leather. There's a handle like a wrapped handle uh, and then there are these strands. They're fairly usually at least an inch thick, an inch wide. Maybe they're mm, like uh, 16 inches long, 12 inches long. And the, the heavier the leather, heavier and softer the leather is, the more this is like a deep massage on your back. And the, the thinner and tougher the leather is, the more it could be very stingy and more awakening or a sharp sensation. And uh, it's important, once again, to be trained in this because there are parts of the body you don't want to flog because it could hurt the kidneys, it could hurt the liver. So you want to make sure that you're, if you're playing with some of these sensations, please take some classes and become part of the community uh, in your area. It's around the world. And then, of course, today you can get the classes online and many of them are very free or low cost And then the question about what is BDSM, Uh, once again, it's it's this whole world of exploration, which one of my favorite parts is that it automatically releases shame. All your fantasies and desires are welcome. Your kink may not be my kink, but it's welcome as long as it's consensual with people that are of the age of consent. And there's been a risk assessment and training and skill. Then let's have let's have fun. but the actual letters stand, so B, bondage or, di- bondage or beatings, D, discipline or dominance, S, service, or sadism. 
uh, an M, uh, masochism or master mistress? Oh, so much interesting stuff here. Uh, I want to go back to how you ventured into sexuality in the first place. Like, what did something, your journey in childhood as a grown up, where, where did you, what sparked? Like many of us, I was raised in a conservative religion and confusing culture that shamed my sexuality. In my personal case, I was given a book at 13 called Tips for Teenage Girls, and it was written by a priest. (laughs) Yeah. And in this book, everything outside of marriage was a mortal sin. And for those of you who might not be Catholic, Catholicism has two levels of sin, a venial or small sin, Like I stole a cookie from the cookie jar and I admit that to the priest and then I say a Hail Mary and it's all good versus a mortal sin like killing someone or French kissing outside of marriage, which would mean that I would ruin my right relationship with God forever, forever. It would be mark on my soul forever, killing someone or French kissing outside of marriage. So anything outside of marriage that was erotic in nature was considered this horrific sin that would ruin your right relationship with God. And I was always deeply spiritual. So when I finished reading that book, I was shaking. I was like, oh, my God. You're 13. I'm 13. I hadn't even kissed anyone. And I'm like, oh, my God. You know, but now I don't want to because I don't want to ruin my relationship with God. And a boy would put his arm around me and I would shake. I would literally shake. And some part of me had heard the word frigid. And some part of, now I would say my higher self, understood that if I let myself be this frightened of men until I got married, and my mom and dad had gotten married about 28, so I, I guess that I would be about the same, that if I had to wait, you know, um, 15 years of fearing men, that even the ceremony of the sanctity, the sanctification of marriage wouldn't take away my fear of men. And there I would be on my wedding day, on my wedding night, frigid, unable to respond to my husband with anything but fear. And I got this at 13. I understood this at 13. And I thought, what am I going to do? Because the curse, the curse of the shame, the curse of the fear was already in my limbic system. It was already in my cells. What was I going to do? And I began to create something that I would later learn in psychology was called successive approximations, successive or little building blocks approximating your goal. So what I would do at night is I would imagine uh, that I was next to a boy. We were in my mind, we'd be fully clothed. And then I would hold that image as long as possible. If I started to feel frightened, I'd let it go. The next night, a little longer. The next night, a little longer. Eventually, I would imagine him putting his arm around me. If I became frightened, I'd let it go. I didn't know then that I was also practicing ventral vagal breathing, which is in the nose and twice as long out the mouth, really emptying the lungs in the nose, twice as long out the mouth. And when we ventral vagal breathe, We are literally wiring our brain towards safety. We are coming out of the parts of our brain designed through multi-generational trauma to try to keep us safe, but end up being hypersensitive, hypervigilant, always worried, always anxious, always looking for the threat. And we actually need to work in today's world to wire the parts of our brain that say, I'm safe. Mm. A stranger is just a friend I haven't met yet. Mm. It's okay. parasympathetic states. Mm-hmm. It's, it's safe to be here in my body in this moment. So I was rewiring my brain to that state around boys. And I took a slow journey with it. I took years. I was a virgin until almost 21. And I always was drawn to, at the time, books and novels that had something of a little taste of sacred sexuality in it. 
And I would sometimes sit with a boyfriend and say, let's practice this. That was in actually a novel. It was like a fantasy novel where they would talk about sitting and eye gazing together. And I would say, oh, let's try this. And then later, I actually um, began to study shamanism and tantra and started to see that these were ancient practices around the world. There's the the Hindu Kama Sutra, mean, Kama um, means love, Sutra means teaching. There's the Japanese pillow book, the Chinese pillow book, the Persian perfumed garden. There's all these texts and teachings throughout the world. <clears throat> and then also in Judaism and in the Old Testament, we have the Song of Songs. You know, that the, the archaeological shards of sacred sexuality are in every religion. They're in every culture, if you know what to look for. And I became so fascinated on finding them. I was on this hunt, Christina. I just, I don't know, there was this hunger in me. I, I just felt there's, there has to be a different way. There has to. The way that people touch each other, the disconnection, the objectification, that I would touch you to get something. I'm going to, one day I realized that I was falling in love as a way to take away the pain of being me. That my falling in love with you is still an objectification. Mm. You know, that, that this usury way that I had been trained, you know, that you have children and your children are there to love you, to to um, give their time, their attention, their money, their career, their agreement to you, that love meant entitlement. So toxic. And some part of me knew there has to be something different. There has to be another way. And I just, I went on the hunt for it. I was un, un freaking stoppable about looking everywhere from archaeology to ethnography to psychology to science to, you know, religion to weave together in my own mind a way that made sense. What happened? How did we as a culture shift, a world shift from a time of collaboration and attunement and deep honoring of sexuality and the feminine is sacred to a time period where only 1% gets to have value and everyone else is lorded over and we live in a state of fear and scarcity and we objectify each other continuously and we try to control one another through criticism, manipulation, half-truths. How did we get here and how do we get out? So in, in I'm, I'm hearing this and I, I receive from you this deep level of awareness of yourself and of the world at large and a curiosity. And as we, you know, started this podcast around uh, age and sharing of wisdom and you being at a time of, of rising as an, as an elder. Now, what was the process like to go find your tribe? Like, did that, was that somewhat of a lonely journey? Because I felt like it in my own right of, you know, I have childhood friends and at times I feel so different from them that I go into these other spaces. And I imagine of your journey starting uh, nearly, you know, 40 plus years ago, what was that what was that journey like to find the people that you resonate to have these deeper conversations and experiences with? Hmm, such a great question. And I want to say that where I was 40 years ago in very conservative culture with people that don't really understand about energy or source being outside their religion or who have a very confined, uh, strict, uh, in a way, uh, codified worldview that 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 world is still here. You know, it's around us. And I travel and teach around the world. So sometimes I'm teaching in communities or cultures that all of, you know, what we're experiencing here at Unleash is very, very new for them or unknown. I can't even talk about gender as fluid or multifaceted because that concept is so unknown. So there is, you know, me attuning as a teacher to where people are. Now, first... I had to attune to myself. Attune means one way of is saying to see, to feel, to hear with love and compassion accurately. To see, to feel, to hear with love and compassion accurately. 
And I really needed to do that to myself, with myself. And in my case, I had come out to San Francisco to start study at the American Conservatory Theater for the summer, stored everything at my parents' home near Chicago, and had also started studying this shamanic path. And someone that had my parents' address was upset with me, and they wrote my mother a letter saying that I was a witch. And my mother called me up hysterical, good Catholic woman. She called me up hysterical. And when she asked, are you a witch? And you're at what age at this point? At this age, I'm 28. And when she asked, are you a witch? I n- knew that the way that she held it in her mind was was limited, fearful, negative, And the way that I was holding it in my mind was shamanic, restoring harmony and balance, connected to, you know, the earth, air, fire, water, spirit, you know, heart, body, mind, spirit, eros. And as I was trying to figure out how to answer, and like some of us, I'd been hiding, you know, how how we might hide from our family or we might hide from our boss or we might hide from various people. And we're starting to discover who we are, but we're afraid that if we let people know that they'll reject us. And part of me was, am I going to continue hiding? And another part of me said, if you deny this, you're denying your very soul. There'll be a a huge cost to pay Francesca. So I said, I am a witch, but it's not what you think. And my mother said, you're dead to us. You're dead to me. You're dead to this family. I tried. She hung up on me. I tried calling my dad. He hung up on me. I tried calling my brothers. They said, we think you're crazy. I would later find out that everything I owned had been given to the goodwill or just destroyed. My mother went to all my friends and told them I was crazy. I got very sick, very depressed, and I was unable to work in theater and television, which was my first career. And basically, I lost everything. I lost my family, everything I owned. I lost my career. One suitcase in San Francisco, starting over. And I was one of my most profound depressions. And yet, when I look back and I ask myself, would I change anything? The answer is no. Because I needed to die to who I thought I was. So I could become who I was meant to be. And even though at that time I lost everything, what I found was me. And that's been the journey, is this sense of, I would say again and again, dying to who I think I am. Because, so I can become who I'm meant to be. And I don't like the dying. It's like messy and usually has drama in it and it has attachment to something. And I love the rebirth and the becoming and the expansion that is more love, more compassion, more understanding of the complexities of this life interwoven with joy and suffering for all beings. So, you know, it was, it started there. And at first in the shamanic community and the more you know, shamanic, you know, new age spiritual community. I thought, oh, I found my people and they're all so wonderful. And then I saw the shadow and everything has a shadow, Christina. I have a shadow. What has a shadow? You have a shadow. Unleash has a shadow. And by shadow, we mean that which is lost, hidden, suppressed, rejected, or denied. Anything that is lost, hidden, suppressed, rejected, or denied in the psyche. So if I say I'm never angry, then anger is in my shadow. If I say I'm not creative, creativity is in my shadow. If I say I'm not like you, Christina, then my inner Christina is in my shadow. So, and sometimes when we fall in love with a person or a community, we put them on a pedestal. And that's the child in us wanting to be saved. You know, at last, at long last, I found that perfect authority that's going to sweep me up and and hear me and love me and carry me and and save me from the pain of being me. And no one is perfect. Sooner or later, everything falls off the pedestal. So that community eventually fell off that pedestal for me, and there was a lot of drama and mess. And then on the other side, an expansion, and ultimately a deepening of compassion. When we look at the roots of Tantra, which is sometimes called the weave is one possible uh, definition. It's weaving everything together, darkness and light, and understanding that if we're really going to love anything, we love the all of it, what it is, what it's not, it's becoming and it's unbecoming, 
and understand that that's us as well. So now I would say that my kindred spirits, well, maybe you, (laughs) and is that now I feel like I connect with them everywhere. You know, that there are people of heart and spirit everywhere. And I feel these, these like golden threads of loving connection around our earth. And I meet people, it could be at the airport, it could be in the women's bathroom, it could be, you know, it could be anywhere, and suddenly start having a conversation that is very depthful and meaningful. And I realize, oh, this is part of my soul kindred. This, is, this, this person is already a part of me, my heart, my spirit, that there's a recognition, isn't there, when that happens? And I would say today, and some of you may relate to this, you might at times feel like you don't belong anywhere. This can also be very shamanic, where you feel like you don't belong anywhere. Like, I go to this community or this festival, but I don't know if I really belong there. You know, I go to this maybe a church, which is new thought and really beautiful, but I don't know if I really belong there. You know, I, I do yoga, but I don't know if I'm just a yoga practitioner. And so you're like, where do I belong? Where do I belong? And there was a point, and it was uh, in a shamanic training that I was in where uh, we were off site, we were camping and my, my tent started to be flooded and pigged. Like there were pigs that came into my tent. And so I'm crying and and, Oh, I need help. And the community is helping me move my things to someone else's tent that starts to flood. Then they move me to another tent in the morning that's flooded. Then someone says, oh, you can come to my tent. It's big. Well, I get there. It's like, you know, Goldilocks. The tent is actually small. There's no space for my things. And then one more person says, you know, you can come to my tent. So if I'm moving things for the fifth time, a part of me says, this is my life. This is my life. I never belong anywhere. This is just such a symbol of my life. And then my higher self, whom I've come to really adore, and it's the still quiet voice of the soul. It's the still quiet voice of the soul. My higher self says, <clears throat> Francesca, what? Um, you're, you're in that victim place of suffering. I know, I know. It's like, because I don't belong anywhere. And my higher self says, um, you know, I'm just going to invite you to try something on here. Um, it just is a possibility. You know, you can choose suffering if you like. But what, how many times have you been moving your stuff? Five. Yeah. And have you been doing it alone? N- no. Have people, in fact, been helping you? Um, Yeah. Have people been offering you their tents? Uh, uh (laughs) Uh-huh. What if, just a thought, what if instead of you don't belong anywhere, what if you belong everywhere? What if who you are is a bridge? And doesn't a bridge belong to both sides of the river and the river itself? Perhaps who you are and who you're meant to be is a bridge. So now when I feel alone, which will happen at every festival, every party, every relationship, it doesn't matter. I will go through my lonelies. I remind myself, ah, I'm a bridge. I have those moments of feeling alone because I actually really belong everywhere. And I'm meant to connect souls and hearts and spirits with concepts and with each other throughout this earth and maybe that's you too if you're listening Mm. thank you so much for speaking to belonging and sharing that personal story in there because it's definitely something that I've struggled with I know that Jorge you've struggled with me everybody has um, struggled with this sense of of belonging and personally I Years ago, an astrologist, actually two astrologists separately, had said to me, um, most people will never understand me. And I remember the second time the astrologist told me that this is, you know, years ago, and I went to go put a comment into Facebook, like, wow, now two astrologists have now told me most people will never understand me. And then I was like, wait, this is not this is not a good thing. No, what, what do I need to change? How do I need to, how do I need to communicate better? Like what is wrong? And I called, I had a relationship where I could call the second astrologist um, or the one who had told me a, a years prior. And I said, Brian, you know, someone else has now told me that most people will never understand me. What's, what is this? Like, what do I do? And he said, oh, well, Christina, it's because you're multifaceted. You're a little like everybody. And when people try to put you in a particular box, you do something different that's not inside of that box and they get really, really confused. 
And I think not only of now looking at that box of being the other people's viewpoint in, but also the surprising myself too at times, like, where is it? And that came about, I imagine, for a lot of us during COVID and the vaccine and what we were feeling and thinking that we would feel the same way as the person that were so close to us. And then all of a sudden we realized we actually think differently around politics or vaccines or so forth. So thank you so much for, for sharing that and speaking that. Because we talked a little about um, the studying of uh, BDSM, if that's something that you're curious and interested about. I would love to end on you sharing what are some things to look for in trusting that this is the right place to learn from. And I know sometimes that, you know, maybe people want to go for green lights. We always want to hear about like what the green lights is, but if you could share some of the, the green lights and also some of the red flags as well. Yeah, great question. Thank you so much. Um, to especially to the to the young little innocent part of me, safety is so important. You know, the primal might be like, oh, you know, that sounds tasty. I want to try that. And you know, the young innocent parts of ourselves are so precious and deserve a lot of safety. So, what I want to invite us to look for inside is. Are there parts of us that are so hungry, so lonely, so excited about some of these fantasies that we're almost willing to do anything? And that is an inner journey. So there's a tendency for submissives to become codependents. There's a tendency for dominance to become domineering. The definition of dominant is actually competent, confident, and holding authority. So one could be a very wise, very gracious, very empowering dominant or one could be an abusive, predatory, uh, arrogant, tyrannical dominant. And a submissive, if they're codependent, could actually be very draining, very reactive. So the dominant also gets to vet submissives as the submissive gets to vet dominance. So if our hunger and our you know, needs are glorious and divine, but we become needy when we're too depleted, I would invite us to to look within and have a little care if we're becoming so needy that we're not able to vet and ask questions and slow down a bit. I would say that anyone who is saying it has to happen, it has to happen right now, you know, it's now or never, this is your last chance, regardless of it's kinky or non kinky, run. I have categorically found that people who are putting that sort of pressure and or seduction into that it has to all happen now are not healthy for me and that my healthiest relationships have a sense of spaciousness. There's time. What kinky or not kinky, there's time. We're going to have time to explore this. We're going to have time to discover this. Whether we stay together as a couple or not, I really want you in my life. So we have time. So green flag a sense of spaciousness, red flag, a sense of pressure, coercion. It has to happen now. A green, f- red flag, a sense of neediness. Uh, green flag, a sense of, you know, self-ownership, a capacity to check inside. Let me check inside if this is right for me. Let me, um, let me taste that in myself. I would say green flag is let's take this slowly and try a few things and then check in. So you're saying you want flogging, but you've never been flogged. You just heard it on Christina's podcast, and it sounds interesting. Uh, let's, let's just do this for a couple seconds. Oh, and by the way, I want to, and this is very important in BDSM, we want a, a check-in scale, either green, yellow, red, or 1 to 10. Green, go. Yellow, slow down. Red, stop. Or 1 to 10. 1, are you doing anything yet? 5, ooh, this is perfection. Seven, we better slow down. So uh, either one can be played with, but if I was flogging you and we're doing one to 10, if you didn't think I was doing enough and I said, give me a number, you could be like one, you know, which would let me know that I need to go much harder. And five would let me know that I'm right at the right spot. At seven, I'm going to start slowing down. So we want to make sure there's a scale in there that is being used. We also want to be sure that there's a safe word. A safe word, like 
there are so many things from BDSM that every relationship could use. I want to check in no matter what. <laughs> How's the pacing of my strokes, honey? <laughs> um, two. <laughs> yeah. Like, wouldn't this be great? Or, you know, seven or, you know, five. So uh, a safe word stops the interaction. It stops the play without shame. Without shame. And a safe word is something that you're not going to be using in the role play. So if I want to role play being, you know, hunted and pounced, then I don't want no to be my safe word. So it's like, no, stop, don't, help. Oh, no, no. Oh, oh, my God. No. Well, then, you know, you don't know that when I'm like, no, you don't necessarily know that that's really a safe word. So we want to pick safe word is one that we could use. Red could also be used. Some people use like pumpernickel or anything else. It's a word that wouldn't normally come up when you're interacting. And then one of the other things I love from BDSM is negotiating aftercare beforehand. It's one of my favorite things in BDSM is that we break the myth of good sex means that you don't, you can't talk about it. You know, that if we're really attuned and the vibe and the energy is just all there, Christina, we'll just kind of know how to touch each other and we just will to, oh, you know, just go right into it. And that it's somehow not sexy to go, oh, Christina, I'm really noticing that I'm feeling very turned on by you and I'm starting to have a desire and I'd love to share with you more of my desire and hear more of your desire and see if there's some match and actually hear more about if you have any relationship agreements that we need, you know, we need to know about share mine, kind of a little STI thing, so that when we actually jump in, it's like we're able to jump in with a lot of freedom. And one of the things that we talk about is how do we want to handle this afterwards? You know, are you somebody who likes a lot of space? Do you like to journal? <laughs> you know, are you, uh, are you somebody who likes to be held, spend the night? It's the gold standard in BDSM to not only negotiate immediate aftercare, but also that check-in a couple days later. Wouldn't it be great? Think of some of our dates, right? Wouldn't it be great to know that we were actually going to check in two or three days later and kind of do, you know, the debrief, like what worked for you? What Was there anything that didn't? What would you like more, less, or different? And the world, like, you know, you can feel the whole world shifting with these kinds of conversations. So when you're looking for what's safe, you're looking for people that are having this kind of negotiation with you. And unsafe is, I saw Fifty Shades of Grey or some other BDSM movie, or I've been watching kinky porn. Therefore, I know I'm a kinky dominant or submissive, and we should just go do things. I would consider that unsafe, sometimes common and yet unsafe. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your stories. This was so powerful for me. I actually am looking forward to going back and listening to this episode in another space so I can be grounded within this information because this is a, a lot to take in. This is like a podcast you listen to a few times, which is actually interesting because we met someone here at... Uh, at Unleash, who had said that deep in with Christina, when she listens, she realizes that she needs to be like really grounded and not doing a lot of other things at once because there's so much rich information that is included in um, in each of these episodes. Thank you for doing the work that you're doing in the world. Is there a, a, a final thought or actually even um, information that that our listeners can access of yours outside of just this particular episode? Mm, if you're, you know, I'm not the right message, not the right frequency, so to speak, for everyone, but for some people, I'm like water in the desert. If I'm water in your desert, uh, I'm Francesca Gentile, F-R-A-N-C-E-S-C-A, Gentile, G-E-N-T-I-L-L-E. And I'd love to have you follow me on Instagram or Facebook. Coming up is a year-long practitioner program, shamanic, tantric, somatic, healer practitioner program, both dark and light, that I'm creating with Lucia Gabriela, partially online and partially in person in Sarasota, Florida. Uh, I'm also for coaches and therapists, doctors, nurses, I teach kink-conscious clinical care through the International Institute of Clinical Sexology. 
So if there's something that you're called to, I also counsel couples and help bridge sexual differences and return the spark and heal trauma. So if there's something that you're called to, you know, please find me. And if I'm not right for you, I'll definitely look for other people in the community that are. And I think my last thought would be when you touch a body, you touch a soul. You touch the wounds from the past and the hopes for the future. Every time when we touch a body, we touch a soul. We touch the wounds from the past and the hopes for the future every time. May the way that we touch ourselves and one another be a blessing. Mm, it's like poetry. <laughs> um, I hope this listening experience was a beautiful one for you. There was leaves blowing in the background and trees and people all around. This is Unleash that we are recording from. There's 200 people out here in the Miami heat, connecting, dancing, playing, doing tantra work. Um, and the next Unleash will be September 22nd to the 25th in Austin, Texas. And it'd be so much fun to have you come and join us. Maybe Francesca will be there again. I will be there again. Jorge might be there again. And we can all drop in together in person. I also really love um, the year-long program that you're speaking of. That's something that... Um, I personally would be interested in diving into at some point in my life because that seems very valuable. Uh, now, before we jump back out and go play, we're going to go have some lunch and, and play it Unleash. Jorge, did, what is it that you took from being an observer and listening to this episode? It was enlightening, to say the least. Um, I've never considered myself kinky. I've been with women who wanted me to slap them and get rough with them. Uh, I had one partner that uh, I was in an open relationship with, and I suggested tying her up, and she had never been tied up, and she found it exhilarating and to surrender, and it was beautiful, and to have that like you, you mentioned that dominance, but it was, I mean, I'm just that type of person that wouldn't hurt a fly <laughs> and let alone beat her with, flog her. So, but I, what I appreciated was that anyone interested in exploring BDSM get educated. And what did, what was that meetup you mentioned? In BDSM, you can look at meetup.com. But the term is off, often called munches, a BDSM or kinky munch. And munch literally means that it's often at a restaurant, a bar, a cafe, and you'll be fully clothed. There's not any BDSM play happening, so you don't have to worry. It's literally an opportunity to meet people and ask questions. Thank you again for how long was this? An hour? And so appropriate here at Unleash and it was a pleasure to meet you and listen to you your wisdom your experience your stories it all started with that one book at the tender age of 13 by a priest and the dissonance led you to hear mm. the dissonance you had with that book that suggestion those tips and set you on this course of exploration and thank you for teaching people the mass is all about bdsm mm. thank you all for listening to another episode of deepen with christina i'm your host christina weber founder of we deepen we deepen.com go check out the calendar see the upcoming experiences we will as this journey continues unfolding we will be sharing places where you can learn bdsm uh, in a safe and healthy way because there are definitely benefits. And I will lastly say is that, you know, if I rewind with where I really first heard about BDSM, it's like those Dateline TV shows, investigation discovery that you're like, what the fuck? People are dying during BDSM and speaking. So it's beautiful to hear about the healing benefits um, and the significance of doing this work in your own personal uh, growth and, and evolution. And hey, maybe I'll have a future story to tell you about my experiences. Okay. If you enjoyed this podcast too, go subscribe, like, leave a comment, reach out. 
And uh, thank you all. Until next time, I love you. Bye.